The title of this morning's sermon is Crippled But Not Abandoned. Crippled But Not Abandoned. And that scripture I ask you to turn to in 2 Samuel says, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel that they had died. And his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass. And as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. God, I pray that you would anoint this word to our hearts and our minds today. That we would receive from you. And we lift you up and give you glory and praise for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. The nurse of Mephibosheth. She obeyed a divine instinct. When she responded to the quite dreadful news of the death of Saul and the death of Jonathan. Their tragic deaths and... So she took up Mephibosheth in her arms, and she fled from the danger that she perceived that surrounded him. That nurse saved Mephibosheth that day from the death at the hands of the Philistines, and as a result, Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul, was saved alive to receive the tribute and the gratitude from the future king, David. And Mephibosheth deserved this for his father's sake and his grandfather's sake. And Mephibosheth was saved from death, but he was not saved from injury. He was saved from death, but he was not saved from tragic injury. And so only God knows what that fall and the resulting injury did to change the course of Mephibosheth's life, the life of that nurse, and the life of everyone else involved. And we know that Ishbosheth, who was the uncle, was also killed. He was murdered there in his bed in what seemed to be a terrible tragedy. Ultimately, was, his, uh, was Mephibosheth's escape from a tragic death at the hands of the enemy. You see, there was divine intervention that took place. There was mercy and grace that took place in the lives of Mephibosheth and that nurse. You see, Saul, Jonathan, Ishbosheth, they were all now dead. And Mephibosheth, now crippled, but still alive. And yes, he was only five years of age, but he was still in the lineage of the king. He was still in the lineage of Saul, the king, the anointed king, and he was Saul's grandson. He was Jonathan's son, and and, and God intervened, and God made a way for David to become king of Israel. He was now the anointed king of Israel, and and without the continued interference of the family of of Saul and Ishbosheth and Jonathan, David didn't have to worry about any of that. They were all gone. They were dead. But David was a man after God's own heart, and David was still a man of what is right and what is wrong. David was a man that made many mistakes, but he did understand morality. He understood good and evil. He understood right and wrong. And David very easily could have enjoyed the death and the injuries to Saul and to his family. After all, Saul had caused David much trouble. And after the deaths of Jonathan and Saul and Ishbosheth, there was a path that was slightly easier for David to be made king. But remember this, David was a godly man. In all of his mistakes and failures, he was still a man after God's own heart. And there was once an American philosopher by the name of John Rawls that died earlier this century. And while a lot of his thoughts may be quite subjective, Mr. John Rawls was a strong proponent of the original position. And what this philosopher, Mr. Rawls, was trying to prove is is this. How would you act or how would you respond to something prior to all of your life experiences? How has your life affected the way that you think? How have your experiences affected the way you think? And what would you do had you not had those experiences? John Rawls wanted people to consider how their experiences and how their their arrival at certain circumstances affected their behavior and affected their successive desires. How you feel about someone has a lot to do with how they've treated you. But how would you feel about them if you had not experienced those things? And this is what I want you to see in King David's society in this situation. This is what I want you to see in King David's actions in these circumstances. You see, David could have let his path to the throne cause him great joy. 
David could have done uh, so, so much that he might relish in the fact that Saul and his sons were now dead and that Mephibosheth was now crippled. You see, David had a lot of experiences that would have caused any of us to excuse David for hating Saul and for hating Saul's family. David's experiences of hiding in caves, running from Saul, running from Saul's soldiers, all of this could have caused David to have some serious desires for retribution and retaliation. All of this could have caused David to do what many kings have done throughout the centuries, and that is kill the entire family. David looked at how Saul and how Jonathan died. David looked at how Ishbosheth was murdered. David looked at these circumstances and he responded with, right is still right. And wrong is still wrong, no matter what the circumstances are. He said, it doesn't matter what I've been through. Morality is still morality. It doesn't matter what I've been through. God is still God. It doesn't matter what I've been through. Right is still right. Wrong is still wrong. And, and David had a grip on his morals and his values. And so instead of looking at the plight of Ishbosheth and Mephibosheth, David looked at the eternal principles that there is a God in heaven who says this is right and this is wrong. And David looked to those eternal principles. And so David, he separated the man from the opponent. Because Saul was every bit of an opponent, but he was also a man, a man anointed by God. And so David separated the life from the circumstances. There were a lot of bad circumstances involving these situations. I mean, after all, now many people are dead because of the actions of others. And even though all of their deaths and their misfortunes have paved a pathway for David to become king of Israel, David did not excuse the sin of murder for his own benefit. Sin was still sin, and David knew this. And it was in moments like these that caused David to sing such songs as some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Amen. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. It's situations like this that cause David to sing such songs as, as we will trust in God no matter what everyone else is doing. Cursed is the person who trusts in people instead of the almighty God. Cursed is the person who trusts in their own arm and their own strength instead of trusting in the Lord of kings, the Lord of lords and the king of kings. Cursed is the person who says, I got this under control and says, saying, Lord, I need you. People will fail you. But God is always faithful. People will hurt you. But God is always faithful. Humanity has done all kinds of things to all kinds of people. And everybody in this building right now could excuse different bad behavior because of the experiences that they've been through. But no matter what we think, right is still right and wrong is still wrong. Sin is still sin and holiness is still holiness. Somehow, some way, you need to understand that if you'll just let the Lord do what he does and what he does better than any of us, God will always make a way for you and make a way for me. I don't always understand the ways of God. I don't always understand the, uh, why God does what he does. In fact, I'll just be transparent with you and say sometimes I don't like the way God does things. And I would contend that Noah probably didn't enjoy building a boat for almost 100 years. Without the patience of me, a hundred days would have been too long. Brother Newby says that's right. <laughs> I also contend that God makes a way for those who have become crippled along the way. And you think that somehow that your life experiences have messed you up so badly that you've been forgotten and that you've been abandoned. But God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. The things in your life that have messed you up will never cause God to forget you or abandon you. Mephibosheth did not become the king of Israel, even though he was in the lineage of the king. He was the grandson of Saul, and he was a surviving member of the royal family. By all means, 
By blood, he should have been king. But Mephibosheth did not follow in his grandfather's footsteps. And, and some might contend that Saul's failures as king caused his family to lose the throne. And yes, 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 we know that Saul made some incredibly awful and stupid and ignorant mistakes. And we know that Saul went against God. But God never forgot about Mephibosheth. And God did not allow David to forget about Saul and about Saul's family. And while David had every reason to go ahead and leave them in the past, David asked, is there any person living who is of the house of Saul that I may show kindness unto him? David said, I want to know if anybody is left alive. And, and, and look at this. There's a servant who served in the house of Saul who is now responding and says, Jonathan's son, the one who is crippled, is still alive. And, and, and he was crippled, but he was not abandoned. Because I want you to see that God placed Ziba in David's house. Think about this. Ziba was a servant in Saul's house. Servants from the prior king weren't supposed to be in this house. They could be traitors. They could be spies. They could be problems. They need to go. Many times they were killed or even buried with the, the previous king. But here's Ziba, a plant from God. God placed Ziba in the house of David as a connection to the house of Saul. You see, without Ziba, nobody would have known about Mephibosheth. Do not overlook the servant. Do not overlook the person that God has put into your life to serve you. Do not overlook the connections that God has placed in your life. God has connected some things in your life, and you don't need to overlook them. You need to understand that people are in a place for a reason. God has done some things for you. And sometimes God puts people in your life as a connection to something else that he has specifically for you. And sometimes God just wants to use you as a connection for somebody else. Maybe you are Ziba in certain circumstances. So my question is, are you available to be Ziba? Are you available to say, yeah, I know someone who's still alive. Yeah, I can put two and two together for you. Let me take you to another book, the book of Esther. You see, it was Harbona, the king's chauffeur. The only time Harbona is mentioned in the Bible, he's the one who helped Esther and Mordecai. Yeah. You see, he, he was the chauffeur of the king. He had the ear of the king. And, and it was his testimony that led to Haman, the enemy, being hanged on the gallows he had built for the Jews. You don't need to underestimate who God put in your life. The placement of Harbona was very specific. It's mentioned one time in the Bible specifically to testify on behalf of Esther and, and Mordecai. And it was Simon of Cyrene who carried the cross of Jesus. The Cyrenians were Greeks and Romans. The Cyrenians were a hedonist, sensual bunch of people. They were idol worshipers. The, the Cyrenians, they, they weren't people who loved the Jews. They, they weren't fan of the Jews. And yet God has this man there passing through town to be called out of the crowd to carry the cross of Jesus. And, 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 and so I want you to look over at Acts chapter 13, verse 1, where it says, And there was Simeon, a black man, and Lucius, another person from Cyrene, another Cyrenian, and Menaean, a servant in the house of Herod the Tetrarch, a servant in the evil Herod's house. And these are the men that God placed in the room to pray for Saul and Barnabas when they were leaving for their missionary journey. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't John. It wasn't Isaiah or Elijah or Elisha. It wasn't Moses or Noah. It wasn't Abraham. No. So we see people like Simon and Simeon and Lucius and and, and, and Menaean, these, these people that we only see mentioned once or twice, but those are the people God put in place to connect different people with different circumstances. These are the men who prayed over Barnabas and Paul. So don't ever think that you're forgotten. Don't ever think that you're abandoned. You see, God can put any person 
in any place at any time to ensure that a way is made for you. Your coworker may be, have been put there by God for you, or maybe you were put there by God for them. And Mephibosheth, he was out of sight and out of mind for a long time. It was a long time before David remembered and said, is there any still of the house of Saul? By this time, Mephibosheth, he had resigned himself to being abandoned and forgotten. By this time, Mephibosheth had realized, I'm never going to be in the king's house again. I I'm never going to, to sit at the royal table again. By this time, Mephibosheth had given up on ever eating the royal food and to drink from the royal cups. And, and, and by this time, sitting at the king's table was a long, distant thought. Mephibosheth had long accepted, I'm crippled, I'm forgotten, I'm abandoned. But God... God stirred the heart of David, and, and David asked, Is there anyone left who is of Saul's family? Is there anyone left who, who, who's of the family of, of King Saul? And I know it's been a long time, and, and I realize that they're probably all dead now, but something's stirring in my heart, something's stirring in my mind. I, I want to know, is there anyone left? And, and so God has Ziba, that servant there in the house of David. And, and so David sent his people to go and get Mephibosheth. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to, unto David, Mephibosheth fell on his face and did reverence to David, the king. And so David said to him, Behold thy servant. David said, Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth responded, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake, and will restore thee. Wait, 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 what? David said to Mephibosheth, I will restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father. And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Mephibosheth, everything you lost, everything that would have been yours if you had been in your place. Mephibosheth, I am restoring it all to you, all the land of your granddaddy Saul, everything that should have been in yours that you should have received as an inheritance. Today, I'm restoring it back to you. I'm giving it back to you. And Mephibosheth was so surprised because he had already resigned himself to being a loser. He had already resigned himself to being forgotten. He had already resigned himself, as his words are, being a dead dog. He had already given up on life. He had already given up on his dreams. He had already given up on ever making it to the king's house. But you see, God had already blessed the house of Saul. And it was God who called Saul and who anointed Saul to be the king of Israel. And yes, Saul really messed up. But that was on Saul, not on Mephibosheth. You see, we do know that it's generation to generation that curses were placed on children. But we also know that blessings were from generation to generation. And the blessings that were supposed to be on Saul and on the house of Saul, they were restored to Mephibosheth. And David called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and all to his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall t uh, till the land for them. You shall go and garden the land for, for Mephibosheth, grow crops for Mephibosheth, and, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. And he said, I, I want you to understand, I want you to fill his table with great food, and, 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 and I want you to understand that Mephibosheth's family needs to sit at that table, and you need to make sure that they are blessed. And, and then he says, but Mephibosheth himself, thy master's son, shall eat bread at my table every day, always for the rest of his life. And so you have Mephibosheth who thought, I've been abandoned, I'm forgotten, I'm lost, I'm never going to see the king's house. Now is being restored back to the table of the king. You need to understand that sometimes 
It may seem all is lost in its darkness, and you don't know how long it's been since you had hope, but you've got to understand that God's putting all things together for his good. To those who love him, he works out all things, and he puts people in place. And so finally, Mephibosheth makes it to the table of the king. Through the hand of David, the one that Saul tried to kill. Through the hand of David, God restored the land and restored the wealth of Saul to that crippled Mephibosheth. He said, I'm nothing but a dead dog. What he was saying is, I'm forgotten. I'm useless. I'm worthless. I'm abandoned. I'm of the old guard's family. But God had another plan in mind. And Mephibosheth ate at the table of the king the way he was born to eat. Hear that? He went through a lot of rough things in life. They weren't planned. But ultimately, Mephibosheth ate at the table of the king the way he was born to eat. And you and I, when we repented of our sins, and we were baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ, when we spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance, we were born again, and Jesus Christ has made us kings and priests. And yes, we have fallen, and yes, we have sinned, and yes, we have made some mistakes, and life maybe is not what we thought it would be. But you must understand who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, maybe famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I, I, I want you to hear me today when I tell you that nothing is going to separate you from the love of Jesus Christ. You may have been abandoned and forgotten. You may have made some mistakes along the way. You may not be who you wanted to be or what you thought you would be. Your plans may not have all worked out the way you thought they would. But there's a Zeba in the house of God that's saying, wait a second. I remember Mephibosheth. I remember the one that's been abandoned and forgotten. And he goes and gets them. And the king says, you're going to sit at my table. You're going to eat of my food. And so I want you to hear me today when I tell you I've been young and now I'm old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. He said his seed is blessed. We are the seed of the king of kings. We're, we're kings and priests. We are the sons of God, and I'm telling you, you are not abandoned. Paul said we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. And this is Paul now. Paul said, we are perplexed. This, this, is, this is quite a dude now, and he's saying, we are perplexed. He wrote half the Bi uh, New Testament, and he's still saying, hey, we're perplexed. Sometimes I feel like we think when we're perplexed that we're doubting God. Sometimes I feel like I believe or you believe People fall into the trap of thinking when they're perplexed that they've lost faith. But the Apostle Paul said, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. Amen. He said, persecuted, <laughs> but not forsaken. Not abandoned, not forgotten. He said, we are cast down, but we are not destroyed. Amen. Mephibosheth was dropped by that nurse trying to escape with his life. Mephibosheth was crippled at that fall. And then all of a sudden, we don't see or hear from him again for a long time. And, and, and it's not until King David is in a peaceful kingdom that finally the king says, is there any left of the house of Saul? And, 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 and Ziba, the servant, is there. And God said, I have placed a man there to remember the house of Saul. So go with me to the writing of the prophet Isaiah. God said, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with you. Yeah. When you go through the rivers, the rivers are not going to overflow you. 
He, he didn't say you're not going to pass through the waters. He didn't say you're not going to go through the river. He said it's not going to overflow you, and I will be with you. And he said when you walk through the fire, you're not going to be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. He said when you go through all the troubles of life, you're not going to be consumed by the fire. The, the flames are not going to kindle upon you. The, uh, your clothes are not going to be singed. The hem of your garment's not going to be burned up. Your hair's not going to be singed. You need to understand. He said, I'm going to be with you. And it may be water, and it may be flood, it may be river, it may be fire, it may be darkness. But you need to understand that when you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he said, I will be with you always. I have not forgotten you. I have not forsaken you. I have not abandoned you. So the prophet Micah said this. He told the enemy, he said, rejoice not. Don't you dare rejoice against me, oh, mine enemy. He said, when I fall, I shall arise. Amen. See, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. There was a Philistine enemy that was very excited that Saul and Jonathan and Ishbosheth had fallen. There was a Philistine enemy that was very excited that Mephibosheth had disappeared and that he was crippled and that he had fallen. You see, that nurse fell and crippled that little boy. And that boy thought he was forgotten. And he thought he was abandoned. And he thought he would never be at the king's palace again. But look at what the prophet said. He said, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. I want you to hear me today. God promised I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you always. God promised that you are still a child of the king. You are still invited to sit at the king's table. And one of these days, those who are faithful in the darkest of nights and make it through the flood and make it through the fire, like Mephibosheth said, you will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. You will sit at the table with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There will be no more tears. There will be no more death. There will no, be no more sorrow and no more pain. You're not forgotten. You're not abandoned. You're not rejected. Yes, you've been through hell in life. But that doesn't mean life is over. The king is coming and he says, I'm going to invite you to sit at the table with me. There's something that happens. Something that happens when you sit at the table of the king. You see, he thought I was worth saving. And when you arrive at the king's table. I remember when I was a little boy, I heard a preacher preach on this message. The Bible doesn't tell us this, but it's not difficult to see. That trying to make it to the marketplace, Mephibosheth, was crippled and injured. But when he sat at a seat at the table of the king, you couldn't see that anymore. All you could see was royalty. All you could see was everything is right. Everything is good. He's at the table of the king. He's eating of the feast that the Lord has provided. Would you stand with me today? I don't know where you are in life. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know if you're on the mountaintop or the valley. But what I do know is if you live any, any at all, you're going to have some Mephibosheth moments. 
And I want to tell you today that God's already put Zeba in the house for you. Zeba's already in the house just for you.